Hello and welcome to this webinar presented by Corporate Secretary Magazine in partnership with ComputerShare Governance Services. I'm Neil Stewart, Editorial and Research Director with Corporate Secretary Magazine. And on the agenda today, today's top entity management risks and how to mitigate them. So we will be discussing the current thinking around subsidiary management from managing data to the overall governance framework and with a focus on adopting risk management technology. The slide deck for today's webinar will be available to download after the event, immediately following it on the event page at corporatesecretary.com. We will be taking questions during this live event, and we are live tweeting it at hashtag CSMWebinar. That's hashtag CSM for Corporate Secretary Magazine Webinar. Now to introduce who we have to address this important topic. First up, Andrew Moore, President of Computer Share Governance Services. Andrew, if you wouldn't mind telling us what has brought you to this stage in your career. Hi, good afternoon, Neil and everybody. Uh, I've been involved in entity management for the best part of 20 years uh, uh, in my various roles. So I've had a good opportunity to look into lots of companies' uh, entity management structures uh, and leverage that experience to help evolve our technology platforms over here at ComputerShare. So looking forward to today's discussion, Neil. Thanks, Andrew. And indeed, you have been at the forefront of governance and compliance technology and, and in fact, really had a, a major influence on the evolution of uh, subsidiary governance, for that matter. Uh, Cynthia Cruz, Corporate and Securities Transaction Attorney with Sutherland. Cynthia, welcome. Hello. Um, I've been involved as well uh, with companies for, um, especially from the legal perspective, for um, over 20 years. And I think what I would say is, um, effectively, I've seen the the, the um, sea change or the transition that's happened um, in um, corporate governance and entity management as a result, um, primarily of uh, Sarbanes Oxley and then Dodd Frank, on how companies have tried to manage through that. Um, and in connection with um, transactions that I've worked on, I've advised boards and management as well as. As, um, I've been working as a, um, the editor of the Corporate Secretary Answer Book, which hopefully we've addressed some of these issues um, for everyone to, um, um, to go to and try and find some of the answers. But it's, a, it's been a very interesting um, ride, I would say. Well, thank you, Cynthia. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, uh, it's a good point to mention that ComputerShare has produced an excellent white paper on this very topic, and uh, there is a link to download it in the overview pane on your webinar screen. Uh, that you can you can go to that link and download a white paper called Top Eight Considerations When Deploying Entity Management Technology. Um, excellent, excellent read. Now, um, just as before we get into our discussion. Uh, Let's look at the results of some polling that we did prior to the webinar with registrants, and that is we asked, what is your greatest challenge with respect to your current entity management process? And as you can see, the number one answer was centralizing global entity information, followed up by ensuring data accuracy. Andrew, is that what you would have expected? Uh, quite conveniently, yes. Uh, <laughs> those, are, those are really hot topics, and uh, they are – they're elements that a lot of companies struggle with, in all honesty. Uh, it's uh, for different reasons, but I, we're going to touch on some of that today. So it really does dovetail well, I think, into some of the, uh, uh, the, the next slides we have for the discussion today, Neil. How about you, Cynthia? Does that reflect what you're hearing from clients? Um, absolutely. I think it's, um, you know, it's an unappreciated risk um, today. And um, I think as most people on the uh, line probably know is um, basically the focus on the managing the subsidiaries doesn't really get um, much um, attention until something goes wrong. Um, and then everybody looks around to find out um, who was responsible. And so you definitely don't want to be um, on the end of not being able to do some business because you don't have the proper license or you can't bid or you're not in good standing because all of those things will impede your operations unit which is what's really going to cause you a problem. And as a, really the only solution to that is um, centralizing information. Very good point. Some of the impetus behind even looking at this issue. Now, before we get into uh, to talking even uh, again, let's, let's do a little bit of a temperature check with our audience and ask our first polling question. So, yes, audience members, we would very much like your input, and we would like to gauge where this audience is with respect 
to managing your global entity structure today. So this question is, how do you manage your global entity structure? Uh, centralized database provided by vendor, centralized database developed internally, spreadsheets, paper files, or none of the above. Now, Andrew, I'm curious to know, if, if, if we had a, cr a true cross-section of North American companies, where would we be with respect to the adoption of, uh, of entity management so uh, technology? I, w I would say if, if, the, if the audiences gravitate towards mid-sized to larger issuers, then I, I'm going to imagine that they, they have some sort of centralized uh, technology solution of one shape, size, or another. Uh, that would be my expectation, Neil. Uh, it's, it, it is still it is quite an, uh, uh, an advanced practice discipline. I think it's you know what we're going to talk about some of the risks and some of the evolutionary changes that are going on today. But uh, uh, I think a lot of folks have a database. I would expect to see. Okay. Well, let's look at this audience. Let's look at the results now. And as you can see, over half do indeed have a centralized database from an outside vendor, and another good chunk have their own internally developed database. Uh, about 15% still on spreadsheets. Um, paper files only 6%. Uh, so that's 55% are using a, a vendor-provided database. 16% their own database. 15% spreadsheets. So uh, a fair rate of adoption for for our audience. Cynthia, let's go straight into our first slide here and get a sense of the context for our discussion and introduce from a legal perspective why so much attention today is on subsidiary management. Sure. It really comes down to the, um, the, the increased scrutiny um, that, that regulators have had. And, um, I mentioned at the top that one of the reasons that there's been more focus by people is that the, the regulators, for example, um, in the U.S., have um, been implementing SOX. And even though that's been around for quite a while now, people are still learning how to apply that at an entity level. But um, it's really hard to say that your, um, your workflow or, or process is going to have appropriate books and records in order to issue your 404 reports if you can't um, basically bring up um, fundamental data um, or even prepare an org chart. So it's, it's, that's one of the reasons that you've seen a lot more focus on it. Rolling forward, um, there's even been more of a flurry of um, basically regulatory activity that's just becoming extremely complex. Um, and just because you're not in, um, located in one um, jurisdiction doesn't mean necessarily that you're not going to um, have to look at the um, application of some of these regulations because they're extraterritorial. Um, for example, the Financial um, Conduct Authority in the U.K., um, the new FACTA requirements in the U.S., um, the IRS has, look, has just been looking more um, at you know, tax evasion, um, the FinCEN or FinBar um, issues, as well as, for example, I don't really need to mention um, the whistleblower um, payment that just got um, uh, announced, which was about $30 million. Uh, a lot of the issues really go to um, issues about fraud um, and mismanagement. Uh, and so what I would say is you've got to um, basically identify those, those risks. They, they can be the um, ones that I just mentioned, or they can be um, cultural, or they can, um, they can be employment, um, labor. You really have to understand the, uh, the area that you're, um, you're going into. I would also say it's not just risks that may come out of um, political instability and that type of thing. It's also the areas of the, um, the world where there's, I would say, overregulation, um, and I would say to the, um, some of the um, UK issues where I mentioned it may apply to you even though um, your, not, your main location is not in that jurisdiction. Um, I think that that's been brought up quite a bit in connection with some of the bribery issues. So the first thing is identifying um, those regulations. And then you've got to um, identify the risks that are pulled forward by those um, by those regulations. And I, I want to pause for a minute because I, I do think that um, one of the areas that, that I want to focus on is um, uh, basically the, the exposure of your directors. When you're looking at um, risks, I do think that in addition to the regulations that I've talked about, that I, I don't think there's enough um, focus on the, of the fact of who's actually taking action at a particular level. And for example, um, there's a, a, a bench trial that came through in Delaware um, where the uh, judge, um, I'm going to read a quote because I think it's so significant, talks about what the obligations of our independent, of independent directors. 
the quote is, independent directors who step into situations involving the fiduciary oversight of assets in other parts of the world have a duty not to be dummy directors. If the assets are in Russia, if they're in Nigeria, if they're in the Middle East, if you're in China, you're not going to be able to sit at home in the U.S. and do a conference call four times a year and discharge your duty of loyalty. That won't cut it. There will be special challenges that deal with linguistic, cultural, or other issues. Um, and he repeats, the, <laughs> and you can't be a dummy director again. My, my point is that really um, at the end of the day what the regulators are getting at is to focus on who's implementing the actions, and when there's um, liability attached to it, they're going to come and look for the directors and officers of that entity. So the next risk, obviously, is the, what we talked about, the legal and um, compliance risk. Um, that really comes down, again, um, somewhat to records, and um, one of the areas that the technology we're going to talk about helps you out with is making sure that all those records are easily accessible um, and that you have them. For example, um, making sure that all of the entities you're dealing with have the appropriate minutes and that type of thing. Um, there are some write-ups that I've got on um, corporate veil, and one of the ways you can stay away from impinging the corporate veil is to make sure you have a, uh, basically a um, distinction between the companies um, and that there's separateness. Um, there's about 31 items, I think, that the Delaware courts have actually um, cited to. But um, you have to make sure you, you have that type of um, record keeping in place. Then the, moving on to the, the risk is unauthorized um, commitments. You want to make sure that if you're taking action through a specific subsidiary, you have, in fact, have the, um, the authority to do that, and then you need to check internally on your financial, your tax, commercial, and operational issues. So how, how do you manage these, these risks? It really comes down, in my mind, to um, what I heard earlier today called information um, governance. It's people, process, and technology. And we're going to focus on technology because that gives you access to information, but you really do need to make sure that the people and the process are in place. Well, with that, let's look at the people because really that's uh, where some of the complexity first comes in. You know, uh, Cynthia, thank you for that excellent, concise overview of the challenges. And it, I thought it was interesting that uh, while you did address, you know, political instability and process, corruption issues in far-flung places like China or India and those types of typical problems around subsidiary risk management, you also pointed out that some of the highest risk is in the Western economies and with the FCA and FACT in the U.S. and IRS and even the risk of overregulation. So this is not just about uh, doing business in emerging markets. This is very much an uh, 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 issue that's close to home. But Andrew, introduce us to how you start to grapple with all the different people involved. Well, it, it, it builds off uh, Cynthia's good points there that, you know, starting from the regulators, the key word is regulators, plural there. I think a lot of people uh, think of a regulator, you know, being industry-based or just a broad-based uh, uh, oversight. But what, what issuers are seeing is multiple layers of regulators in multiple jurisdictions, and some of them have global remits and, and functions. And, and, you know, beyond the traditional kind of entity data, which is very much basic type stuff, you're seeing this co-mingling of requirements from regulators that will bring in tax data, finance data, basic core entity data, your risk oversight policy, your board structure and the governance around that. And so what you start seeing is that the whole notion of entity management is a true multi-stakeholder discipline. Uh, and as you know, good points by Cynthia at the beginning that it's one that's absolutely underappreciated quite often. Uh, invariably, is, you know, uh, only comes to the surface when when issues uh, arise, things go wrong. But what we're seeing is that you know, if you're going to have a robust, strong entity management process, which does need people, it needs to be uh, an across the enterprise uh, initiative. Starting right at the top, right? You know, we, we talk about it, buying starts at the top. But it's as cliche as it is, it's so important that they, you know, you need to get that direction, that the governance and the compliance framework that we, you know, are subject to is important to us. It may be even a priority for us based on our industry and the regions in the world which we work. And, and that really sets the tone because that sets the, you know, the, the, the usual challenges of an organization, which is, funding and people, right? So how are we going to address this? How are we going to deliver this? 
how we're going to line up our law firms and our providers to assist us in this process. As Cynthia alluded to, it's, it's, it's more than uh, just the technology. We believe the technology is at the core, at the center of it, but you know, this stakeholder uh, approach is, is critical to a sustainable and robust uh, entity management, uh, risk management uh, structure for your organization. Cynthia, can you give us an example of how important this stakeholder approach is? Well, if, if you don't have buy-in from all the various part, um, uh, units or divisions, you've got you know, legal, bank, banking, finance, tax. As, as, as we all know, basically most information about entities were, was kept on individual PCs or individual departments. Um, you're just increasing the, um, the possibility of, of human error. Um, and not being not having accurate information if you don't have a centralized source certainly you can um, build different ways to have um, information approved for a change but you have to have everybody come together and not have kind of a silo um, mentality because and in addition if you look at the um, the listing auditors is on here so it's it's not just even the internal stakeholders it's external stakeholders as well and you've got to make sure that whatever you're doing internally you communicate um, to them them as well. And, and just a, a, a point, there, there was recently a study done by um, uh, Grant Thornton, and they um, came back with saying that at a management committee level, only 48% of the companies that they surveyed had um, compliance personnel on that management committee. And I would just say that in order to make an, um, basically have an effective program, you really have to have um, compliance or corporate secretaries on um, that kind of management committee or somehow involved in that process. Um, in addition, Great point. Um, yeah. yeah. And just one last thing is just the, another um, um, interesting fact was that boards of directors, um, there was, uh, and I think many of the people who read the corporate secretary might have seen this, is that um, there's a lack of um, international experience at the very top. So I was speaking about the management committee here on the um, board level, only two in ten of the directors that they surveyed at the top hundred companies who take out more than 50 percent of their revenues actually um, are have uh, international experience. So it's only two. It, it, in order to basically understand the global risks here, I really do think we have to elevate the, the knowledge level. And it, basically co-opting into these um, programs can't be optional. And that really does have to start at the tone at the top. So a lot of room for improvement both at the management level and at board level in terms of compliance and in terms of the international skills needed for global entity management. Well, Andrew, let's move on. And I mentioned before the white paper that Computer Share has prepared, and it's available for download at corporatesecretary.com, or you can also link to it on the, uh, the, the overview pane of your live webinar screen, or find it on the event page uh, for this uh, webinar at corporatesecretary.com. So these are indeed all eight of the top considerations around uh, deploying entity management technology, but let's focus on uh, number Number seven and number eight today, Andrew, and, and go straight into this next slide, which is about that uh, entity, entity data, the, uh, managing data and records. Yeah, uh, th th I mean, th th this point, you're hopefully at the point that, uh, you know, you've established your budget, you've established the resources, you've, you have buy-in from the top, you have a working program, you've elected to get some technology, and, and you're going to put in a big amount of effort to get that technology live and updated. We have this centralized source of your, for your legal entity information. The challenge we see with lots of companies then is, okay, that, that, you know, there's a big push, a surge of resources and, and, and uh, initiative to get that done. And then obviously there's a little pat on the back where we've done it. But what happens after the party, you know, when people go back to their day jobs if they've been seconded or you've let the contractors go and the resources, the, a, 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 big challenge and as evidenced by your polling is staying on top of that information or even being able to, you know, attest or certify to a regulator body that, uh, you know, when was that last date, when was that data last checked, when was it last reviewed, who signed off on the entity, uh, how did we get it, you know, is this the current set of, you know, directors, the ownership structure correct, et cetera, et cetera. And, and this is a big, big challenge for organizations. But, you know, it's an area where technology, if you think about it, can, can support your processes and your policy, and it can allow you to automate what we call like entity sign-offs, be them quarterly, bi-yearly, or, or whenever it may be. You can look at controls to, to kind of do uh, reactive compliance. 
You can also look at better controls as people populate this database. What we see a lot of times are, you know, you build the database, you put it up there, and then who can actually enter the data, who has controls and rights for that, isn't properly managed. And you end up then with a, a worse than no database, a bigger database that you think is right and it isn't. And that's where you need to look at uh, approval pr processes and controls. So, you know, a four eyes principle. So this group over here, they can actually in the field, they can enter the data when it happens, when the change, the corporate action takes place. But there is somebody with a separate set of independent oversight eyes looking at the supporting documentation. Was there a minute, a resolution? Was there, you know, some other uh, activity paperwork that supports it? Validating, verifying it, checking against your controls before it's shared and disseminated with the wider population. Because in today's world, those databases, again, aren't islands. They're very much connected. So, uh, you know, you go and add new entity or make a change of ownership structure in that database. That can trigger itself notifications and updates to the regulators and other bodies uh, in a real-time basis. And so you want to make sure that that data being disseminated and, and sent around to the different stakeholders is, you know, accurate, uh, properly complete, and meets all your internal policies. So there are, you know, there are, it's a real big challenge. It's perhaps the number one challenge that we see. It's a challenge clearly that people are recognizing uh, in your poll today, Neil. And, uh, the, you know, the good news is there are technology solutions and, and protocols that you can incorporate into your governance framework to, uh, you know, relieve the burden that uh, uh, is this uh, broader compliance progress. Good, okay. Let's turn now to in the international perspective, Andrew. Well, that, that really, uh, you know, has a different element to it. So, um, but, it, but I think it's becoming actually uh, something that everybody's more aware of in today's world where clearly, you know, it's a, it's a global uh, marketplace. More and more of us are working and looking at the world as a singular global opportunity, less as, you know, uh, regional and isolated. But that has... Uh, uh, enormous consequences and considerations for the way we look after entities. Cynthia's pointed out a lot, you know, uh, and then we can, and we'll certainly add more to this in terms of the, the particulars of, you know, doing business in a certain jurisdiction and the challenges that may be. But even if you, we take that to aside for one second and just look at your own organization and look at how you manage that internally, and you're trying to put in this, you know, multi departmental. Uh, uh, cross-discipline entity management process. You know, a key consideration here is, you know, the people on the ground that you're asking to participate in that. What we see in there is, you know, at establishing that buy-in, uh, you may have it at the executive level. But the last time I checked, the execs aren't the one that are actually <laughs> doing the work in terms of keeping stuff uh, up-to-date and accurate, and you're relying on the controls at the ground level. And, you know, a key, key value proposition there. Um, is, is, is trying to show how you can add value for those local uh, legal teams, compliance teams, tax teams, whoever it is, even business folks that are, that are working as part of this broader government remit. So what are you doing to address their local needs? Do you understand their needs? Is your database sufficiently flexible to adapt to store their, uh, their local terminology, their local data points that you need to track? Some jurisdictions, you're dealing with regulators, you need English, and then you need the local language, right? You need kanji uh, in uh, Japan. You know, you can't file in English. So how are you going to do and meet your local reg regulatory needs if you've just got an English-only database? Key considerations for the broader compliance program, and again, it's one that, um, and, and not all companies, but a good number of companies forget about it because they, they tend to focus on their, their dominant or their local domestic regulator, not regulator, not you know, really fully recognizing the importance of, you know, all the global regulators that we talked about at the beginning of the webinar, and that failure to comply with one of them is, is just as bad pretty much as, as it is with any other one. So um, it's, it's, you know, especially in this social media world, you know, if you have a problem in the Far East, that will get to your domestic market pretty quickly, uh, and it's just about as quick as a, a failure in your local market will as well. So. Uh, very important, lots of multi-layered issues to consider when it deals with uh, the internationalization of entity management. Now, Cynthia, whether it's on uh, data management or the international entity uh, challenges, do you have anything to add on those, on those things? 
I, what I'd like to say is, um, and this is a, a, a phrase that I think is very helpful, is um, the think globally and, and act locally. The globally is your, um, your, your technology or your processes that are in place, but then um, acting locally is understanding the, the variety of um, issues when you're dealing with, um, you know, even if you're talking about uh, France and labor issues, Germany and, and privacy issues, I think privacy is one of the areas we need to focus on even more with all the um, issues that have been happening with cybersecurity. Um, you know, for example, India, um, when you're dealing with directors, they just came out with new res residency requirements. So you have to have um, not only the technology, but that updating that technology. And just to give you um, one or two other um, kind of best practices, again, the approval process, I think, is very helpful to have um, somebody sign off if someone in the field is actually trying to update the, the, um, the information. I think it's also helpful not just to have that approval process that's coming through maybe a corporate secretary or compliance person, but um, the evidence has to be there um, before you can do anything with it. I think that that's actually very helpful and um, probably what you've heard from attorneys all along. But the other thing is, is monitoring. I know that resources are, are tight with companies these days, and what I would say is if you're, if you're looking at an um, international subsidiary that, that you you want to monitor or, or, or check on, uh, what I would suggest is you could potentially use your internal audit team um, and arm them with some checklists to, um, to go um, at, um, and, and see if you, the processes that you're putting in place are there. One last note would just be, be very, very careful of, um, of entities that you're acquiring and making sure that they've followed some of these compliance procedures because getting that into the process is one of the biggest issues that I've um, experienced. Okay, good. Thank you, Cynthia. Now, as we lead up to taking some questions from the audience, we, let's push out another polling question and get a, a bit of a temperature check again at this stage in the conversation. And uh, just as we do this, um, to remind you where uh, this is, could we advance the slide? Uh, just advance. Uh, please, Ellie, and we're talking to Andrew Moore from Computer Shared Governance Services and Cynthia Cruz from Sutherland. Now, here's the polling question we want to ask the audience as we, as we move ahead, and that is, on a scale of 1 to 10, how confident are you uh, with the accuracy of the data within your current entity management system, with 10 being extremely confident and 1 not confident at all? Now, Andrew, can you comment on this? Do you get a sense that there is perhaps hubris amongst uh, companies, uh, complacence, or is it actually a state of fear just now? Where do you think we're going to come in on, in terms of confidence in entity management systems? Um, I, 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 I'm less clear on this one. It'll be interesting. Uh, I think, I think uh, it would be interesting indeed to see the results. I mean, there may be a little bit of complacency. You know, the litmus test is, you know, it needs to be independently assessed. And unfortunately, quite often, you don't find out until something does go wrong, right? And that's the challenge. So that is where the, the you know the, the regular sign off is is important. You know, uh, to use Cynthia's words, you know, evidence to show. Well, why do you believe your data is accurate? What do you have to show me that this data is accurate? And if you're going to talk to, well, look, we have 300 entities. Here's the all 300 were signed off by the individual compliance managers as of this day in time. Uh, you know, that's the type of stuff that people want to see and understand. Uh, and and that's. Uh, It'd be interesting to see how people are doing and addressing that type of program uh, to, to certify their results, essentially. Well, let's see where the confidence level is. Let's push out the results and, uh, and have a look. And a reminder to the audience, you can click the Ask a Question button on your, uh, on your, uh, on your screen and, and pose a question to either Cynthia or Andrew or both. And let's have a look. So in terms of confidence level, about 27% is at a high confidence level of 8 and uh, uh, secondarily, 18% is at 7, so pretty confident group here, about 18% also around the middle at 5, and just a small slice uh, at uh, 3 or 4, and nobody reporting at 2 or 1 in terms of uh, a confidence, and that being lack of confidence. So um, fairly, fairly confident group, but not too confident and not too unconfident either. Um, Let's go uh, now to some uh, questions from the audience. And the, the first one we have is to do with, uh, I guess you'll call it localizing the subsidiary management. And, Andrew, the question is for you, and that is when, it come, when, when you're using subsidiary management technology, how much can you tailor to local rules and languages? And is that important? Um, yes, it is important, I believe. And, and it, there are varying degrees of localization you can adopt. Um, and, you know, here at ComputerShare, we're not just called localization, but personalization, because 
you know, what we talked about there is, you know, when we talk about the multiple stakeholders in an organization, what you, you'll see is what's important to a tax person isn't necessarily as equally important to a corporate secretary. And so you want to make sure that the, the, the views are different, the data point is presented differently. Um, and that can be, you know, terminology, that can be uh, different fields and elements, and you can do that in technology today. You can apply the same with different business logic, right? Just very simplistically, you've got a paralegal in Canada and a paralegal in the United States. You've got qualifications and extra-provincial registrations. It's essentially the same thing. You're registering that entity in different jurisdictions to do business. But the terminology can then at least, you know, it sends a message to in either your U.S. or your Canadian paralegal in that regard that you, that you, you, you understand them. You, you, you get it, right? I'm not just forcing my view of the world down your throat. And that, that really is important for the engagement of staff in, in the process. If you want to adopt different languages, uh, you can go that, uh, uh, to that extent as well. You just need to be very clear on the guidelines around when multiple languages are used in certain fields. You want to establish proper protocols around, okay, here's the primary name of the entity, for instance. Here's the name of the entity in the local jurisdictional language. So you use that as a separate field. Then you can still get a, a full English list of all your subsidiaries, and then you can have their secondary name uh, listed alongside that and use that for merging into resolutions or other jurisdictional filing. So it, it, it's, it's important. It's absolutely very much available. Uh, you can do you know, jurisdictional filings, companies, house filings, the Australian ASICs filings. They can be plugged straight out of uh, uh, an entity management solution, cutting down compliance costs, improving efficiency, and again, sending what we believe is that important message to those folks on the ground that, hey, we know this is for a big head office reporting initiative, but there's something in it for you to Okay, so that's interesting. So it's, you know, it's and it's not just regional, or is it? Uh, it's it's the type of user. So a tax user might have different needs from a, a legal user, and a, of course a U.S. versus U.K. or or Chinese user. All all can be uh, have personalization around it. Now, Cynthia, a question for you, and this is about a very hot topic just now. And and the question is, is data privacy a risk around subsidiary management today? I, I think it definitely can be. I mean, you've got a couple different components of, of, of privacy. Actually, um, yesterday we were, were talking about um, information that may be being stored on um, the, these um, various databases uh, where, for example, in, um, in a jurisdiction there might be an issue uh, about um, director's information because you're taking – usually you have some level of personal information um, uh, for directors. And so the question was, you know, what do you post it? Do you, what, what do you do? And I think the um, sense was, to the extent that there's some sensitivity around it, is um, to um, potentially not include that type of data um, in, the, in the information. You'll have to obviously store it with, um, you know, the compliance or uh, corporate secretary's office or something along those lines. But I do think we need to be careful. And if you're, you know, um, dealing with the cloud and that type of thing, you have to go one extra step and, and I would say, asking about what the protections are on the various pieces of software you're using is is going to be the the key and and it's it's going to um come up um Okay, thank you, Cynthia. And a, and a final question for you, Cynthia, as we just before we go to a last polling question and conclude our webinar, this is a question from the audience again. What resources can someone use that is new to the entity management role to ensure all documents are organized properly when the company does not use an entity management tool? So any resources you can recommend, uh, whether it's uh, sources of uh, you know guidance or other tools that um, someone who, whose company doesn't have an entity management tool uh, could use? I don't have a, a separate management tool. I do think that the, I mean, you're going to have to do this whether you're starting up entity management or um, or, or buying um, technology. Is it, it, you have to use your resources internally. And one of the things that we really didn't focus on is is um, when you're when you've got these various disciplines, um, really you got to work on a way to communicate with everybody. And what I would suggest is you're going to have to use your, what internal resources you have and try and basically. Um, understand what has happened before um, to get it all into um, one um, 
one piece. I mean, the checklist and things like that you could use, but really I think at the end of the day it's going to be getting the information um, correlated um, and get people to cooperate with you in, in order to, to get that information. Um, I, I was listening to um, one corporate um, secretary was saying that, you know, basically um, looking at things when you're, when, um, you're going into a transaction more from an um, offensive as opposed to a defensive strategy, she would go into um, and participate in the finance um, discussions um, it was their capital um, finance committee in order to see what was coming down the pike and what kind of issues would be coming up. So I, I think it's um, it, it's somewhat informational. So I, um, I apologize, I don't have a better tool, but I think that, that it's got to be um, somewhat legwork. What about you, Andrew? Any comment on that? Uh, short of a proper entity management solution like you offer, mm -hmm. uh, are there any recommendations you have? Um, yeah, I, I obviously, you know, by say, I would say that, you know, technology is a good starting point. I'd say I, there's no silver bullet. There's no one, you know, uh, guide uh, that's going to cover everything. The best advice I would say is leverage your peers. Uh, you're, you're fortunate enough to be in a fantastic community, lots of really knowledgeable people out there that have gone through this already and through either the society websites, some of your own uh, social groups, Neil, um, and, you know, some of the other client communities out there on LinkedIn. There's, some, there's a lot of great information. Uh, but, just, you know, ultimately you're going to need people to, you know, act on that best practice. Uh, and, you know, respectfully, we think you need some sort of technology repository at the core of it to harness your findings, your data, uh, and whatever it is you decide uh, to build a policy around. So. Great point. Okay, an excellent sort of concluding message. Let's do a final temperature check of the audience as we wrap up, and that is what do you think is your greatest risk by not having a managed solution? So this is a question for our audience, and again, this is we'd love to know what you think. What is your greatest risk if you don't have a managed solution, if you don't have an entity management tool? So A, is it regulatory audit? Is it damage to corporate reputation? Is it expense? Is it, God forbid, job security? Is your, is your job on the line? Or is it all of the above in terms of greatest risks? So let's see what the audience thinks. I mean, uh, Andrew, is, uh, is there any one of those that stands out above the others for you? I, I think it's, it's got to be all of the above, really. I, I think it's, it's, it's pick your poison. Otherwise, uh, I would say that uh, all one leads to the other. <laughs> you know, yeah. some, some you know, regulatory uh, audit damage. Uh, could lead to expense, which could lead to lack of job security in itself. So I think there's a, there's a lot of correlation and it's, uh, uh, between them all. Cynthia, that reputation damage is a tricky one to put your finger on. It's always so hard to, to quantify, uh, but it's definitely a big risk, isn't it? A absolutely, and, and that's what I was going to focus on um, on that because there's there's really an expectation in the world um, today that you do have a handle on some of these more fundamental issues um, and your ability to um, basically coordinate all that information and use it not only to reduce costs but also respond. Um, you know, for example, um, y you want something that works well, you know, kind of on a day to day basis. But if you've got a crisis, you have to have a base of that information in order to to um, to, to respond. So it's um, and those are the types of things that are going to help you out um, and avoid reputational risk. And I think that that, especially globally, is one of the biggest areas as we've seen kind of with some of these cyber um, attacks. That really, it's somewhat it's reputational more than anything else. Okay. Well, let's look at the results then for our uh, this our final question from the audience and see what the greatest risks people believe uh, was a uh, uh, by not having a managed solution. And we can see that all of the above, as you said, Andrew, is definitely the predominant response, 56%. And uh, about a quarter believe it's the regulatory audit. So that regulatory issue, and perhaps as Cynthia alluded to, maybe the risk of over-regulation is certainly high on people's minds. Damage to corporate reputation is all also important there. So there we have the final look, and certainly all of the above in terms of the greatest risks not having a managed solution. Well, let's conclude this webinar. It was a good executive briefing on the topic of entity management and especially a focus on using technology for that purpose. Once again, the slide deck and the white paper are both available to download on corporatesecretary.com. 
You can find them both on the page that has information about this webinar, this event. If you're still on the live webinar, you can download the white paper from the overview pane below the slides. The, this event was, uh, was live tweeted, and there's discussion at hashtag CSMWebinar. That's hashtag CSM for Corporate Secretary Magazine Webinar. Well, thank you very much to Cynthia Cruz, Corporate and Securities Transactions Attorney at Sutherland, and Andrew Moore, President of Computer Shared Governance Services. I'm Neil Stewart for Corporate Secretary Magazine. Goodbye.